Hi there, and welcome to episode two of us talking about LV systolic function. So last time we talked about fractional shortening, fractional area change, E-point septal separation, and then MAPSI. So if you haven't watched that one yet, then we'd recommend you have a look at that first. So this week, we're going to be moving on to cover some things that require a little bit more, um, a few more modes and slightly more advanced echo techniques. So we're going to be talking about S prime, DP over DT, and then cardiac output measurements. So um, cardiac output measurements are one of the core things that we're doing, so, so try and stay tuned for that a little bit later. So we'll jump straight into S prime, shall we? Yes, I'll try not to put you asleep before, before we mm. get to cardiac output measurements. All right, S prime. So... Uh, perhaps the listeners are more familiar with S prime from RVS prime. Absolutely, yeah. um, and it's essentially it's the same principle. So it it is a little bit like you know what it says on the tin. So you're looking at um, you're using Doppler, and we're l using Doppler to measure tissue velocities as opposed to red blood cell velocities, which is mm -hmm. you know what we use it for in other ways in the heart. So the way that it does that is you it's all really set up by the machine, but you place a sample volume over the area of interest, yeah. and use the TDI function and what that will do is use a low pass filter because it's really low velocities but a high amplitude signal yeah so you're going to have a low pass filter on because you want those low velocities of the myocardium and you want your gain settings turned down and that's be you know you don't want it to be fuzzy and have feathering of the mm -hmm. of the waveform yeah um and what that will tell you is how quickly the annulus is um you know moving in systole um, the velocity of that and the higher it is obviously then the better a surrogate measure of your LV systolic function is yeah um, so this is looking at a similar thing to MAPSI, isn't it? it in, a, in a way, it's looking at that longitudinal function at a absolutely. very regional point of the LV. So one thing we forgot to mention with MAPSI is that mm -hmm. it's very regional. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily correlate with the global LV function. So if you've got regional wall motion abnormalities or tethering of that valve from whatever cause, such as the valve replacement or annuloplasty, then yes. you're going to, then the MAPSI or the S prime is not going to be an accurate representation of the systolic function. Yeah, absolutely right. And th I think those are the main drawbacks of it, Chris. Yeah. Um, and also the lack of data in the critically ill as well. You mm. know, for S primes, it's all of the caveats you mentioned, but also we don't have real therapeutic or prognostic utility data for using it. Um, but in, in saying that, I think it still could have a place, especially in those that are difficult to image, yeah. which we know a lot of our patients are. Absolutely. Um, so should we take a look at how we do it? Yeah, so we'll we'll take a look at this. So this is a, an apical four chamber view. Um, and what we're doing is putting the tissue Doppler on. So you can see all these funny images, uh, all these funny colors that um, come onto the image when we put on the low pass filter, which is the tissue Doppler. And that immediately will give us a spectral Doppler trace. So we need to do a few things to optimize that, lower the baseline, turn that gain down slightly. Um, so I think I'm about to do that. Yeah, turn that gain down slightly. And then we're going to take the S prime measurement or just a generic measurement if it isn't on there. And we're going to record that um, the S prime wave there. So if I just go back to that. So Emma, can you just show us exactly where we need to be, um, where we need to be putting that? I know I've got a measurement on there. Yes, Chris, it's a little bit tricky, I think, there, because we want to obviously avoid that isovolumetric contraction spike. Yeah. Um, and so I'd probably, to be honest, I'd probably repeat this particular image because I mm. can't re really differentiate between the isovolumetric contraction spike and the... And the S wave there. Yeah, and interestingly, if we put it on the medial an annulus, and you really can get the isovolumetric um, contraction spike. So here it comes. And here That's is a better. lot easier to see where Much we're better. putting it. Yeah. So what we're talking about here, so we have the E prime and the A prime waves here. And then with the um, QRS complex, we have that initial positive spike and that's the isovolumic contraction spike and then it's the second spike after that that we need to be measuring and you can see that if you are trying to measure the ice, um, isovolumic contraction then you're going to get a much higher measurement than is than is true so it's that second spike here is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that's a, it's a really important tip and trick, I think, because yeah. um, you often see when people are starting out with Doppler, you know, they do uh, tend to make these erroneous measurements. So that's a, 
a really good thing to demonstrate there, Chris. Yeah. And mm. the other thing to say is that with any form of spectral Doppler, if you have the gain too high, then we're going to be um, causing a lot of fuzziness around the edges and that can lead to a much higher measurement. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So normal values, um, these are not clear. They alter with age. Different, um, different uh, societies suggest different things. Um, so I know that the British Society of Echo, where I did a lot of my training, if you're between 20 and 40, then they say that your normal should be over 6.4, 40 to 60, over 5.7, and over 60 is over 4.9. I know different societies have different things, but this is just emphasizing that these things change with age. Yeah, like most um, measurements in Doppler, you know, you'll, when we talk about diastology, we'll talk yeah. through that as well with E primes and things. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, so one that. Do you use this very much? I suppose so, no, but perhaps I should. Obviously, mm. I use this a lot for diastolic assessment and we use yeah. it more on the on the right side, but maybe I sh we should be using it more. And the thing that I particularly like about it is you were saying it is that marker of, you know, sort of longitudinal function. Mm. So, you know, things like MAPC and, and S prime, LVS prime might just help us detect earlier dysfunction than we yeah. otherwise would. Yeah. Um, but no, it doesn't form part of my usual toolkit in nope. the ICU. Fine. For all the mention, or for all yeah. the reasons you caveats you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll move on. We'll move on to um, DP over DT. Now, this is quite an interesting one, really. Um, one that's quite difficult to get your head around. One that's quite difficult to explain in a coherent manner. You sadly, can do it, Chris. that's yeah, why we'll you're. Try. you're <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. So, um, DP over DT is the rate of ventricular pressure rise. So. Um, what we see here is that if you've got an LV that's working very well, then it's going to cause the pressure rise very quickly during contraction. If it's not contracting quite as well, then that pressure rise is going to be slower. If you have a mitral regurgitation jet that you can both see and measure with continuous wave Doppler, then you can, then you can actually measure the time taken from two known pressure points with um, a much higher pressure change in a short amount of time if your systolic function is good. So we tend to use um, a continuous wave Doppler trace. We place that through an MR jet, and then we try to optimize that scale as much as we, uh, that um, spectral Doppler view as much as we can, and measure between one meter per second and three meter per second on the MR jet. So let me just show you what I mean using images because that's a lot easier to show. So here we've got an apical four chamber view and putting some color wave Doppler on and you can see that um, there's an MR jet that we've tried to put the cursor through. And by putting the cursor through, we've got this spectral Doppler trace that can demonstrate um, this mitral regurgitation jet. And what I've already done here is raise the baseline up so that all the negative tracing is going downwards. And I've paused the image. I've scrolled back to find a nice looking MR jet. So this is a relatively okay MR jet that has, uh, that you can just about see it, although there is some cutoff here. So it's not quite an optimal optimal jet, but you can see quite clearly between one and three um, meters per second. And then I've sped up this the, um, the sweep speed so that the the single jet looks much broader and that means that you're you're a lot more precise when you're measuring between one and three seconds yeah that's really important to do yeah. that mm -hmm. yeah and then we're going to find the dp over dt measurement so i'm taking my sweet time with this measurement clearly and we're going to be placing that at the one meter per second and then we're going to be tracing it down to the three meters per second. And using the Bernoulli equation, we know, which is 4v squared, um, we know that 4v squared for one is going to be four, and then 4v squared for three is gonna be 36. And by taking four away from 36, we get 32. So if you divide 32, by the time taken for this pressure rise, then that will give you a value that is demonstrated here, which is usually going to be around the ballpark of between 800 and 1200. Over 1200 is normal, under 800 is definitely abnormal. And then you have the gray zone between the two. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing, so the, so the numerator on the equation is always 32. It's always 32. Right? It's always 32 because yeah. you're always doing between one and three seconds. Yeah. And 
the one of the um, really I think one of the really cool things about DPDT is it is one of the um, less load dependent mm. variables that we measure, which is lovely. Yeah. Um, so this patient um, would fall into that grey zone, as you were saying. So yeah. less than eight hundred abnormal LV systolic function, more yep. than 1,200 um, normal LV systolic function. Absolutely. So this one you have to rely on having um, some MR present. Yes. Um, it has to be at least mild to moderate, otherwise you're not going to be able to trace it reasonably and it shouldn't really be severe, should it? Because the orifice will be too too big. You'll get rapid equalization between the LV and the left atrium and then you'll have a more triangular shaped MR jet, so it won't be representative of the LV function. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly that's the case in acute mm. severe MR. Yeah. So you are absolutely going to get that, that V-shaped triangle um, and making this less less reliable. Yeah. So that's DP over DT, so delta pressure over delta time. So change of pressure in a change of time. So... The other thing to mention, Chris, as well, is often we have lots, um, you know, eccentric mitral regurg and yeah. critically ill. And, yeah. um, and the, you know, unless you've got that lovely parabolic shape where you can clearly see the line between one and three uh, meters per second, then you're not going to be able to use this measurement. But no. if it's there, I just I think it's nice to use. Again, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. do you use it at the, the bedside? Uh, I do. I probably measure it more than I actually use it because I kind of like it and yeah. I like to measure it. Yeah. Um, if it's, it, I find it often falls in that gray zone and I'll tend to use it as a confirmatory measure of what I'm thinking. So if I think that the LV function is impaired, then I'll use it as an ancillary thing to demonstrate that. Yeah, the, the, the times when I particularly like it is when you know that you've got an, an altered loading condition. Mm. So you know, mitral regurg, for example, yeah. and you're thinking this LV, it just looks a little bit down to me, but the ejection fraction is fine. Mm. You know, if we're not doing fancier things like strain and, and those kind of things, then, you know, if you've got a, a low DPDT in that context, then, you know, perhaps you just, you get a feel that you might be, you might unmask LV dysfunction when you correct that mitral regurg. Yeah, just looking for any clues that you can really in that situation, yeah. right? Yeah. So now let's talk about cardiac output measurements. So this is one of the cornerstones of what we do on the ICU. So it's obviously a really important thing. So uh, because of that, I think I'll hand it over to you to talk about, if that's all right. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Take two, because I totally messed up the first one. Um, it is it is um, fundamental for us in critical care. I think it's for everyone, but particularly for us when things are changing so rapidly yeah. and, and we need measures of cardiac output. And we know that echo, if done well, is actually a pretty good measure of, of cardiac output when, com when yeah. compared to you know, the gold standards, one GANS catheter and thermodilution. Mm -hmm. So two main components to this, Chris, is we need to get a really accurate LVOT diameter. So mm -hmm. we can use pi r squared and get the area of the circle. Yeah. Um, we assume for all intents and purposes that the, you know, aorta is circular in shape. And we would zoom in on a parasternal long axis view, as you're going to show here. Um, and... Yep, zooming in and then pausing, scrolling along in mid-systole and measuring at the insertion tips of the of the leaflets at the base there where they join the septum and the anterior mitral leaflet. Yeah. So we're going to, because it's a small diameter, we're going to zoom in so that we've got, we've got as much um, kind of precision with our measurement as possible. We're going to pause on that aortic valve. We're going to scroll forward and back and find when it's in mid-systole, so the leaflets are open. Yeah. And then we're going to measure at the base of those leaflets. I think anything up to 2.2 would be, you know, 1.8 to 2.2 is sort of a normal range. If you're getting values outside of that, then you really should be, you know, measuring again, thinking why are they sort of outside of that range. Um, of course, this, this measurement is not perfect because we're assuming... So, so what you would do with this measurement to then get the area of a circle is pi r squared. Yeah. Um, or you can do that simplified thing of 0 0.785. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, times, what is it? It's, it's 0 0.785 times, times the, the diameter, diameter squared. squared. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I find that a bit easier to do normally. Yeah. Just yeah. But if you use the LVOT diameter measurement on your ultrasound machine, then it will do it all for you. It will. It will, cal that, it will calculate that for you. So you yeah. don't have to get your you know, calculator out and do pi r squared. It will yeah. just calculate it. Absolutely. So that gives us our area of the circle. And now we want to know how far that the column of blood has traveled. So then yeah. we can get a volume in a cylinder. Mm -hmm. And so the stroke distance is is what we get when we do the 
when we integrate velocity and time, right? So yep. the LVOT, VTI, velocity time integral, gives us a stroke distance. Mm-hmm. And then we can multiply that by our um, cross-sectional area measurement. Yeah. So again, um, a few little tips and tricks for LVOT, VTI, you know, a little bit like those for the LVOT diameter, is with Doppler, angle is everything. So we really need to try to optimize that isolation beam being parallel to the maximal mm. flow, transaortic flow. Uh, so that's re- that's at point number one. The second thing is where we place our sample volume. Yeah. And you, because of the continuity equation and all of that, you want to, um, you know, place it at the same point that you're measuring your LVOT mm. diameter. Um, that isn't always possible. And so sometimes yeah. you do, but, you know, what you want to do is place it just behind the aortic valve and you're looking for that lovely closing click. Yeah. Okay. The, so if I, if yeah, I show you show how to do first. this, um, so we're getting an apical five chamber view predominantly, but we could also do an apical three or an apical long axis view. So by doing that, you're getting a four chamber and then just getting a slightly more shallow imaging angle and opening up the LV outflow tract. So this is a a view where I've brought in the, the, um, the sector width a little bit just to improve the resolution. Um, Had a little look at the flow to make sure it's continuing down into the aorta. And then we're gonna place the sample volume just proximal to the aortic valve there. Again, this is going to give us a spectral Doppler oh, trace. You, a and click you did, chair. yeah, 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 very nice. <laughs> um, so we're going to get a spectral Doppler trace here. And this is what Emma was talking about when she was talking about the closing click. So you don't want to have an opening click because that means you're too far into the valve. Too far in, yeah. And then you're gonna get a spectral Doppler trace which is the bulk flow of blood out through the LVOT. So that's all the velocities of blood leaving the LVOT. And then this here, just after the the, um, LVOT trace, this is the closing click. And so this shows that you are in hopefully a a relatively optimal position. And then you're going to take an LVOT measurement. So you're going to take the LVOT trace here, find one that you're happy with, and then you trace all the way around. Nice. I might just mention a couple of things about Mm. this, um, Chris, is that it's really important that you are tracing the modal velocity. Yeah. So the mean velocity of the red cells going through. Mm -hmm. And so you want to really be in the, you know, sort of the mid part of that bright line. Um, You see how it's dark and um, dark in the you know, the center of the mm. spectral profile, and then you have that bright, yeah. bright line. So it's really important to trace that modal velocity. And of course, if you're getting lots of spectral broadening, so you're getting a, you know, turbulent, that essentially means that you've got turbulent, turbulent flow coming through there. It can then be quite difficult to trace that modal velocity, mm. but you've done a really nice job tracing that there. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, if I am sort of critiquing this, or Chris, you know, we could have moved the, you know, the, the wall filter could have been mm. um, you know slightly reduced so we're not missing out on those low velocities right yeah. close to the baseline yeah, and that just improves the accuracy of that tracing yeah. but but it's really nice yeah. and I suppose a caveat to this um, where you've placed your sample volume is you know in most patients that's probably okay mm. but in you know some of our patients that are hyperdynamic that have that flow acceleration just proximal to the aortic valve um you can imagine if we then place our sample volume there that we're probably going to overestimate the lvot vti absolutely and things like things like aortic valve replacements you need to be pr- far more proximal because otherwise you're going to get flow acceleration and you're going to massively overestimate your stroke volume yeah so the main situations where that would be is anyone you know so aortic stenosis aortic mm. valves yeah um septal septal knuckles so big yeah. sigmoid septum with, with hyperdynamic flow just to be cautious of that and just as chris did i think a Top tip um, is to put color Doppler across that and look for your flow convergence zone prior to the aortic valve. And if you can see that flow convergence, just move slightly more proximally back into your LVOT so you're not getting all that spectral broadening and fuzz on your trace. Yeah. Um, but the patients almost become their own control, Chris, because as long as you're measuring in the same point every time for the same patient, then you can be pretty sure that you're getting a you know reasonably accurate yeah, trace. Exactly. Yeah. And you can see here that because we we measured the LVOT diameter with the dedicated measurement and then we've used the LVOT trace, then the machine's already calculated the stroke volume for us. And then 
on G machines, you then move this second cursor to the next LVOT trace, and then it will automatically calculate what the heart rate is, and it will give you a cardiac output. So that's actually really nice. Some machines, if you put in the patient's body weight and height, then you'll also get a cardiac index. So that's even better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and probably worth mentioning as well, it's we should be averaging three, you know, three for sinus rhythm, yeah. um, ideally. Um, and then, you know, atrial fibrillation, you know, perhaps between five and ten, um, you know, an, an average of those probably. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, and I know some places that will actually just use a stroke distance or the VTI and track the VTI, um, both aortic valve and um and LVOT VTI as a surrogate marker of cardiac output and as trends of interventions. So yeah, um, that completely takes out the potential for error with the LVOT um, diameter yeah. and provided everyone's speaking that same language, it's fine. I think it's very fine. And then that's what a lot of the data is validated mm. on, isn't it? Is LVOT VTI and yeah. a change of that of more than, it depends what you read, but somewhere between t 10 and 20 um, yeah. percent change, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, depending yeah. on what paper you read. But absolutely. And it makes much more sense that because, you know, you assume that the patient's LVOT diameter is not going to change. So therefore, you can just use the LVOT VTI as yeah. a surrogate, as you said. Or if someone's had a previous study and you can't get a good parasternal because you've now intubated them, yeah. then use the LVOT diameter from the from previous, previous study. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, you talking about not being able to get the LVOT, um, the LVOT diameter, or even getting the LVOT um, uh, pulse wave Doppler trace in the five chamber or the three chamber, that can be really hard in some of our patients. Yes. You can actually use the RVOT diameter um, and the RVOT stroke volume or stroke distance to infer what the overall cardiac output is, because provided there's no big shunts, then your RV cardiac output should be the same as your LV cardiac output. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I just want to mention, Chris, we didn't mm. mention a normal value for LVOT ah, VTI. Ah, true. Yeah. What do you have? So VTI, in my head, is somewhere between 18 to 22. Yes. Um, but that will depend on the patient. Yeah. And it's probably worth mentioning the causes because a high VTI is also not normal. Yeah, so absolutely. So what, what are the common things that you would think of with someone with a high VTI and what well, would you go looking for? Well, I mean, for any reason, so it could be a general issue with the patient. So they could have, I mean, people could be in a high cardiac output state for whatever reason. They yeah. could be vasoplegic, um, yeah. leading to them having enhanced cardiac output. Mm -hmm. um, but there could be valvular abnormalities and insufficiencies. So you yeah. could have aortic regurgitation is particularly nice. one um, that you're likely to lead to having a high VTI. Yeah. yeah. So it's just being mindful again, you mm. know, when you see a value that's even higher than the normal yeah. range. It's not a just, win. It's not a win. It's not a win. You, just, you need to exp obviously explain why that yeah. transaortic flow is increased, either because of hyperdynamic circulation or, as you were saying beautifully, I always mm. look a little bit harder for regurg whenever yeah. I see a high LVOT yeah, VTI. Yeah. So RVOT. Yes. So I'll just show the RVOT, um, RVOT well, how, how you would trace this. So um, this is a basal short axis view. So you can see that you've got the aortic valve in the middle. You've got the left atrium behind, the right atrium, tricuspid valve, and the RVOT. And if you just try and, try and direct the probe over to the main pulmonary artery over here, then you can see that the pulmonary valve opens up. And then you have the main pulmonary artery with the right and the left pulmonary artery there. And you can do exactly the same process. You can zoom in, you can pause, you can wait for the valve to be open. You can use the RVOT diameter, which I think we have here. You can measure at the base of the leaflets. And then after you've done that, you can measure the RVOT stroke volume, again, trying to get that closing click. So it's worth saying that the RVOT diameter is slightly larger than the LVOT diameter. So um, that means that the L the RVOT VTI is often lower. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I have sort of a value of more than 16 in my head as being yeah. normal for the RVOT yeah. um, VTI. Yeah. And this is particularly useful if you can't get the LVOT trace, but also if that if the LVOT is not going to be accurate for whatever reason, the time we use this a lot is if you had patients with LVADs or if they're on ECMO, Absolutely. because the you can't rely on that LVOT outflow. Yeah, yeah, that's really nice for that. And also, you know, just a little thing as well. If you um, see an RVOT VTI that's much that's higher than your LVOT VTI, then go looking for that right to left shunt. Um, Left to right. Left shunt. to right shunt. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Left to right shunt. My apologies. Yeah. Good. Okay. Through an ASD or something. Through like an that. ASD or yep. a VSD. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. 
Um, so we've talked about actually quite a lot there today. We could talk about hemodynamics all day long, and it's gonna we're gonna have to have dedicated sessions about talking about that and looking at variation in outflow and looking at fluid responsiveness and all these hot topics like that. Yes. Um, but we'll save that for another time uh, because we've already been going for far too long. So. Um, uh, the next one we'll be talking about ejection fraction so this is again going to be full of a few controversies and some passionate discussion i'm sure um but uh we'll leave this one there thank you all for listening thanks yeah. very much bye see you next time